Hello and welcome to HIV RNA Test Guide Podcast. We're diving deep into some really fascinating HIV research today coming out of Montreal. Our listeners send in some pretty interesting articles about um, a potential breakthrough you know, in HIV treatment, a possible way to actually target these hidden reservoirs of the virus. You know what's so interesting about this is that it could be a, a major shift. I mean, think about it for decades. The focus has been on managing HIV as a chronic condition, right. anti-retroviral therapy. But now we may be talking about an actual cure. That's pretty amazing. Oh. What I've been reading is the challenge is that even though anti-retroviral therapy is really effective at suppressing the virus, it doesn't actually eliminate HIV completely. Mm, right. It's like those weeds that keep popping up in your garden no matter how many times you pull them out. Yeah. That's a great analogy. I like that. Yeah. Those weeds in this case are these viral reservoirs. They're these pockets of dormant HIV that are hiding within certain cells. And they're really tough to get rid of. The other problem is they don't just sit there quietly. They actually cause chronic inflammation even when the virus is suppressed throughout the whole body. And that inflammation isn't just like a minor annoyance. Yeah. Right? It's not like a little snivel. Hmm. The articles mention some pretty serious consequences. Oh, absolutely. Chronic inflammation like that is linked to a whole bunch of other health issues, cognitive decline, cardiovascular disease, even some types of cancer. So while antiretroviral therapy has been revolutionary, these reservoirs are still a major roadblock when we're trying to find an actual cure. And that's where this new research from the Montreal Clinical Research Institute comes in. Right. They're looking into a new approach that could actually target and eliminate these hidden reservoirs. Yeah, and they're calling it the shock and kill approach. It's a pretty descriptive name. Okay, I like it. So let's break it down. What exactly is the shock part about? Okay, so imagine you want to get rid of ants uh -oh. that have built a nest like deep underground. Right. You could try to poison them, but they might just stay hidden. So instead you could try to like shock them out of their hiding place. Make them come out. Yeah, make them come out. And that's basically what they're trying to do with these HIV reservoirs. So you're trying to force the dormant virus to come out into the yeah. open. How do they even do that? <laughs> okay, well, they use this special type of molecule called a SMAC mimetic. Think of it like a molecular alarm clock, jolting that dormant HIV awake, making it vulnerable again. Ah, okay, so reactivating the virus. But why would they want to do that? Because doesn't that make it active again? It does, but once the virus is reactivated and it's out in the open, the immune system can actually see it, recognize it, and then attack it. And that's where the kill part comes in. The kill part being our own immune systems. Exactly. The reactivated cells are then targeted and they're eliminated by the immune system or even through apoptosis, which is basically just programmed cell death. Okay, so it's a two-pronged attack. You wake up the virus, yeah. then knock it out. So if this works, we're talking about actually curing HIV, not just suppressing it. That's the hope. If we can actually successfully eliminate these reservoirs, I mean, it would be a huge leap forward in HIV treatment. It looks like this is still really early research. But Dr. Eric Cohen, the lead researcher, he sounds incredibly optimistic. One of the articles even quoted him and he said, we are very excited about these results because it is a proof of concept that this approach can be part of an approach to cure HIV. I mean, he's definitely got reason to be optimistic. These early results are promising, but it is important to remember we've got a long way to go before this becomes a viable treatment. We need more research. We need to confirm these findings and we need to make sure that it's safe and effective. And we need to look at it in a wider population. Right, but even just the possibility of a cure is just groundbreaking. Think about where we were a few decades ago. So you mentioned these SMAC memetics earlier, and I'm really curious about how they actually work at the cellular level. So to understand that, we need to kind of take a detour into the world of cell signaling. Oh, I'm ready. Let's dive in. Okay, so cells are constantly talking to each other, sending signals back and forth. Right. Some signals promote cell survival and others trigger cell death. And there's this protein called SMAC that plays a key role in regulating this whole balance. Okay, so SMAC is like a cellular messenger. More like a referee. It helps decide if a cell lives or dies. But there's this other family of proteins called IAPs, inhibitors of apoptosis proteins. They act like bodyguards. They prevent cells from undergoing apoptosis. So SMAC is pro-death. IAPs are pro-survival. Exactly. And this is where those SMAC mimetics come in. They're small molecules that mimic SMAC. And what they do is they disarm those cellular bodyguards, and then they make the cells much more susceptible to apoptosis. Interesting. So they're tipping the scales towards cell death. But how does that specifically target dormant HIV? 
Well, that's a really good question, and it's still an area of active research. But one hypothesis is that by disrupting these survival pathways, SMSC mimetics create an environment that's just less hospitable for the virus, so it can't stay hidden. So it's not that they're directly attacking the dermid virus, they're more like setting the stage for its demise. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It's about changing the cellular landscape making it harder for the virus to stay dormant. This is all so fascinating. Yeah. So we've kind of got the shock part figured out. The Isamaki mimetics flush the virus out into the open. But what about the kill part? How do we get rid of those reactivated HIV-infected cells? Well, this is where the immune system takes center stage. Remember the IAPs, those cellular bodyguards? When they're inhibited by those SMSC mimetics, those infected cells are way more visible to the immune system. So they can't hide anymore? Nope. They've got this target on their back. The immune system's constantly looking for these invaders, and now it can see them and eliminate them. But wait a minute. Doesn't HIV attack the immune system? Yeah. So how can a weakened immune system fight off those reactivated cells? Well, that is a really crucial point, and it shows why antiretroviral therapy is still so important. They actually work together. The antiretrovirals keep that overall viral load down, giving the immune system a fighting chance. That's like a one-two punch. Yeah. The SMA semantics weaken the virus, then the antiretrovirals prevent it from spreading further, and the immune system can come in and take it out. Exactly. And it's this coordinated effort that makes this approach so promising. Mm. We're not just relying on one thing, but multiple strategies to eliminate HIV entirely. It's really cool, this whole approach, a real testament to how smart these researchers are that are working on HIV. Yeah. And what's so interesting is that these SMS mimetics were originally developed for cancer. You're right. It's really one of the most exciting parts of this research. Repurposing existing knowledge shows how connected all these scientific fields are. It's a perfect example of how advancement in one area can impact others. Yeah. So we've explored the shock and kill approach. But I want to kind of shift gears now and talk about the bigger picture. What does this research mean for HIV treatment in the future? And what could the impact be for both individuals and society as a whole? It's really exciting to think about the possibilities. Imagine a world where HIV isn't a life sentence. It's something that can be cured. I mean, the impact would be profound. People living with HIV could actually live without fear. You know, the fear of transmitting the virus. They could stop taking those daily meds and they'd have a level of freedom and peace of mind that I don't think we can even imagine right now. It's almost like too big to even wrap your mind around. Yeah. And then beyond the individual level, what about the impact on society as a whole? Oh, yeah. I mean, you can see stigma decrease, healthcare costs go down. And then all those resources could be redirected, you know, to prevention and education. Yeah, those are really important points. It's not just about individual health. We're talking about maybe reshaping our whole approach to HIV AIDS, maybe shifting from a global crisis to a manageable condition. Okay, so let's change gears a little bit and talk about the actual research. We know that this approach is still in its early stages. What are like the next steps? Well, one crucial step is to do some larger clinical trials. Okay. The studies that they've done so far have only involved a small number of people. So we need to know if these results are going to hold up in larger groups and more diverse groups. That makes sense. And that would also help us understand, you know, like side effects and long term consequences of this approach. Exactly. We need to make sure that any treatment that we're looking at is safe and effective over the long term. Okay. The articles you sent mentioned something about biomarkers. Can you explain what those are and why they matter in this research? Yeah, so biomarkers are basically like measurable indicators. They can tell us how someone's body might respond to a treatment. So in this case, scientists are trying to find biomarkers that can predict which patients are actually most likely to benefit from this whole shock and kill approach. So it's like tailoring treatment to the individual. Exactly. It's no. not a one size fits all. Okay. Finding those biomarkers could really help personalize treatment. So we're targeting the right people. That makes sense. So it's all about maximizing, you know, that effectiveness. Yeah. And then also minimizing the risk. Yeah, that's the goal. And that's what modern medicine is all about. Okay. So larger clinical trials, biomarker identification, personalized treatment. Those are the key next steps. What about like a timeline? Any idea when this might actually be available as a treatment? Well, it's tough to predict timelines when it comes to research, but if these findings hold up and they do it in larger trials, it's possible that we could see this approach being used maybe within the next decade. Wow, that's sooner than I thought. Of course, we know that there are still lots of hurdles to overcome, but it's pretty exciting to think that a cure could be on the horizon. Oh, absolutely. And even if this specific approach doesn't end up leading to a cure, 
what we learn from this research will help us get there. Yeah. It'll lead to other breakthroughs down the line. That's a great point. You know, progress in science is all about building on past discoveries, even if they don't lead us directly to where we want to go. Exactly. Each study adds another piece to that puzzle. It brings us closer to understanding HIV and figuring out how to beat it. And speaking of the bigger picture, let's zoom out a little bit and think about the global implications of this research. Yeah. HIV is a pandemic affects millions of people worldwide. Over 38 million people, according to the latest estimates. And a lot of those people live in low and middle income countries mm -hmm. where healthcare isn't easy to get. So even if this approach does work in clinical trials, how do we make sure that it actually reaches the people who need it most? That's a great question. And it brings up global collaboration and equitable access to healthcare. Yeah, because a cure that's only available to a few people isn't really a solution. Exactly. We have to work together and make sure that any breakthrough that happens in HIV treatment is accessible to everybody, no matter where they are or their economic status. And that includes not just the treatment, but the systems that are needed to give that treatment effectively. Absolutely. We need to create a healthcare system that's really equitable and inclusive. So as we go deeper into this research, mm -hmm. We need to keep those global things in mind. Yeah, I agree. Science is a powerful tool, but we have to use it the right way and fairly. Well said. OK, so <laughs> we've covered a lot in this deep dive. We talked about the science behind this approach, the benefits and challenges, the, the global implications. But before we wrap up, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about the impact a cure could have on society. You mean how a cure wouldn't just automatically get rid of the stigma? Exactly. Even if we do reach this breakthrough, the social and cultural work around HIV won't be over. Yeah, I agree. Stigma is really deeply rooted. And a lot of it comes from misinformation, fear, and prejudice. And it can have such a big impact on people who are living with HIV. Yeah. Affecting their mental health. Yeah. Relationships. Access to health care. It can prevent people from getting tested. Right. Or disclosing their status. Or seeking treatment. So as we're celebrating the progress in HIV research, we need to also focus on fighting that stigma and creating a more supportive and inclusive place for people living with HIV. That's a great point. That means challenging those attitudes, promoting accurate information, and fostering empathy and understanding. And listening to those people living with HIV. Yeah. They're the best advocates for their own needs and their rights. Absolutely. Their experiences are invaluable in shaping policies and programs and interventions. So right alongside that scientific quest for a cure, we need a societal quest right. to get rid of that stigma, make a world where everybody can live with dignity and respect, regardless of their HIV status. That's a great vision. I think so, too. And it reminds us that true progress takes both science and social change. Well said. That's why these deep dives are so important. They let us explore all these things, science, society, and the human experience. Yeah, it's not just about the facts. It's about understanding the people behind the science and how those stories shape our understanding of the world. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation. We've delved into all those nuances of this approach and explored the potential impact on people's lives and society. Yeah, me too. It's been a really fascinating journey and it's given me hope for the future of HIV research. And I feel committed to fighting the stigma and promoting equality. I feel the same way. And I think our listeners probably do too. So before we wrap up, I want to leave our audience with a call to action. I love a call to action. What are you thinking? Well, we've talked a lot about education and awareness and empathy. So let's all try to learn more about HIV and challenge those biases that we all have and speak up when we see that stigma. Yeah, that's great. Even small things can make a difference. It's exactly. Whether it's donating to an HIV organization, volunteering, or just having open and honest conversations, we can all help. Yeah, and if you want to learn more or get involved, there's a lots of resources. Yeah, organizations like the CDC, AMFAR, UNAIDS are good places to start. And if you're living with HIV, please remember, you're not alone. There are great support groups, advocacy organizations, and healthcare providers who are there for you. You are strong, you are resilient, and you deserve to live a happy and fulfilling life. Beautifully said. You know what? Even if you don't know anybody with HIV, your voice matters. It does. Speaking out against the stigma. Yeah. You know, supporting those living with HIV and fighting for that access to health care. We can all help make a difference. Absolutely. It's amazing how these scientific discoveries like this approach can start those conversations. We're not just talking about the disease itself, but the things surrounding it in society. This really does feel like a catalyst for change. It's making us look at our own beliefs 
and reimagine a future where HIV isn't something to be afraid or ashamed of. That's what makes these deep dives so important to me. It's not just the science, but the people and the ethics and the potential for actual change. Science is really about improving lives. That I... takes not just being smart, but also being responsible and being committed to doing what's right. You're absolutely right. And that commitment has to go beyond borders. We need to make sure these breakthroughs in HIV treatment are available to everyone. Doesn't matter where they live or how much money they make or anything else. We need to make healthcare fair and inclusive for everyone. A system where everyone gets to live a long and healthy life. And that means tackling the root causes of all those disparities. Things like poverty, discrimination, and a lack of access to education and healthcare. It's a big challenge. But I really do believe if we work together, we can make a world where everyone has that chance to thrive. I agree. And I think this research shows us what's possible when we combine that science with social change. It shows us we have the power to shape the future, not just through scientific breakthroughs, but through what we do, what we say, and how committed we are to making the world a better place. That's a great way to put it. As we wrap up today, I want to thank you so much for sharing all of your insights and knowledge with us. The pleasure was all mine. I always enjoy these deep dives. It's so inspiring to see how curious and engaged our listeners are. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. We hope you learned something new and are thinking differently and are inspired to get involved. Remember, knowledge is power. And when we share that knowledge and talk to each other and work together for positive change, we can make a brighter future for everybody. Well said. And on that note, we'll wrap up this episode of The Deep Dive. Stay curious, stay informed, and stay engaged. We'll see you next time for another deep dive into the world of science, technology, and all things human. Until next time.